I was recently asked why all the cool animals aren't alive anymore. And while it is true, a lot of cool animals are extinct. There's a lot of cool animals alive that you're taking for granted. Exhibit A, the seahorse. An extremely cool animal that, if it was extinct, you would wish was still alive today. It would probably be called the most unusual fish to ever exist. Well, actually, maybe it is already, and it definitely should be. If seahorses weren't alive today, you'd probably be shouting about them from the rooftops. They look like horses, male pregnancy, etc. Yet here you are, probably forgetting they even exist in the first place most of the time. So today I'm gonna introduce you to the seahorse, an animal that is actually pretty sick. Let's get the general information out of the way. Seahorses are weird as fuck. They're like someone took the front of a horse shrunk it down, stuck it in the ocean, threw bony plates all over it, and then gave it a curly tail and a tube for a mouth. But, as you would probably expect, that is not what happened in this case. Seahorses are simply fish of a strange shape. They've been around for like 25 million years since the late Oligocene epic. So, pretty new in the grand scheme of things. There's 47 species that we know of, and they all belong to the genus Hippocampus. Hippocampus, you say, like the thing in our brain that helps us remember shit. Yes. Exactly like that. Coincidence? I think not! Back in 1587, an anatomist named Julius Caesar Orantius was looking at the brain, all the different sections of the brain. Saw the hippocampus. At the time, obviously called nothing. Said, wow, that looks like a seahorse. Others were like, what the fuck are you on? Looks more like a silkworm or a dolphin, maybe even the horn of a ram. Nevertheless, seahorse stuck, and it was named the scientific name of seahorses, Hippocampus. What a cool, sick, interesting fact. I was not very familiar with seahorses before I made this video. I didn't know their genus name was Hippocampus. So when I started seeing that in different articles, I was like, you mean as in the part of your brain? How is no one mentioning that it's the same fucking word? And I looked it up, because I was like, there must be something going on here. Uselessentomology.com said, the hippocampus was named after the seahorse genus hippocampus due to shape. And also said, I know this one seems sort of obvious and maybe even common knowledge given the compound structure and recognizable roots. Mm, it's not. It was not obvious or common knowledge for me. Maybe other people, but not me. I don't know if I missed that in elementary school. I didn't know this and I needed to look it up. So thank you for writing about it anyway. Okay, back to the OG hippocampus. They're found in shallow waters all over the world, in seagrass and mangroves and coral reefs. If you've ever been snorkeling, there's a chance you saw one and an even bigger chance that you didn't because they camouflage to shit because they're sick as fuck. And also very small, generally mere inches, centimeters even. The biggest can get to a little over a foot long, but they are an exception. Unfortunately, seahorse populations are not doing well. Pollution, habitat loss, overfishing are big culprits. People collecting them for Chinese traditional medicine, for aquariums, and in some places, even as a food delicacy. Shit is not going well for seahorses. And I'm sure the thought of not having seahorses around to tell our grandkids about is a horrifying one. No need to fret. There are people around the world working to make sure that doesn't happen, including a conservation group called Planet Wild that you can get directly involved with. I'm gonna tell you about them more at the end of the video. You're gonna love them, so stay tuned. The seahorses are in a family of fish called Cygnathidae, which also includes groups like the sea dragons. Yeah, sick as fuck. We'll get back to those in a bit. And also, pipefish, which, understandable. They look like a seahorse that got stretched out. Which brings me to how the seahorse got their shape. Spoiler alert, it's essentially the complete opposite of this. They got <clears throat> It seems as though seahorses evolved from ancestors that looked essentially like the straight-bodied pipefish. You can see the resemblance in their snout. Dude, actually, pipefish look like those squiggly toys. Those squiggly fish toys attached to the invisible string. You know, you like move them around and it's magic. The fuck are they called? Wait, let me look. Magic twisty worm? Fuzzy worm toy. Okay, what a lame ass name. I feel like they had a cooler name when I was seven. Whatever, this is what a pipefish looks like. A magic twisty worm, fuzzy worm toy. The only difference is they're a fish. And it seems as though seahorses evolved from a fish that looks like this. Straight body, horizontal, swam like a normal fish, horizontally. Then about 25 million years ago, during the late Oligocene, boom, snatched S-curve silhouette. But why? Well, during the late Oligocene, seagrass habitats were expanding. Seagrass looks like blades of grass in the ocean. And you know what blades of grass are? Upright, vertical. So how does one blend into blades of grass? You go vertical as well. That's one thing. How about the curly tail? It's prehensile, as in to grasp. You might have noticed that a lot of the time, seahorses are attached to something. A coral, a blade of seagrass, perhaps. Each other on occasion. That's thanks to the very cool and sick prehensile tail. While they're hanging out, they scan the water for tiny shrimps. Waiting for the perfect moment to snap their snout, and suck up their prey. That's when the final piece of the puzzle comes in, the shape of a stallion, why the S pose? An explanation lies in a paper published back in 2011, an adaptive explanation for the horse-like shape of seahorses. I love when shit is titled straight to the point, no mumbo jumbo. So, seahorses, about 80% of the 47 species, use sit and wait capture strategy, which I explained before, attached to something via prehensile tail, wait, 
and strike. The seahorse prey of choice is small shrimps or larval fishes, two groups that tend to get away from a threat in rapid speed. So fast you don't even see them. So the seahorses need to be fast too. Also, before I forget, I forgot to write this. They have no stomachs. So food just goes right through them. So they need to eat all the time, which means they need to be fast all the time. In order to be the most efficient in your sit and wait strategy, you wanna be able to capture prey from the furthest distance possible. You know, so for example, if this was you, you're in one spot all the time, a couch perhaps. It's beneficial to be able to have longer arms so you can reach further around you to a side table, coffee table. A shark grabber toy would be very appealing to you. For seahorses, it's all about their head. They don't have arms or shark grabber toys. Turns out by having their head angled down more rather than the classic horizontal ship pipe fish got going on, they're able to increase the available distance for prey to be in because suddenly they can, boom, snap their head up this way with a more efficient force than if their head was here. It's like, instead of pow, you know what I mean? Pretty sick. So you might be wondering, why don't pipefish do this then? How are pipefish still around in the first place? If seahorses evolved from unevolved shit like pipefish? Well, they're not unevolved. Nothing is less evolved. It's just adapted for a different lifestyle or niche. Most pipefish swim towards their prey rather than sit and wait for it like their handsome brethren. So the rapid upward head movements would be little to no use for them. They don't give a shit. But there was a pipefish they mentioned in their study, Carithrith Ooh, Carithrithes intestinalis or the scribbled pipefish that does have a similar strategy to seahorses in behavior. They are a maverick in the pipefish community. Before they start feeding, they make their head more curved like a seahorse and use the same kind of spring-loaded bullet in the chamber feeding strategy. Cute. Understandable to see how this would become extreme over time in the seahorse ancestors who adopted this newfound sit and wait strategy in the newly developed seagrass. And it is extremely effective. Seahorses have something like a 90% success rate when feeding. That's up there with some of the most successful predators on the planet. Black-footed cats, dragonflies, servals, etc. If you're a tiny shrimp that's found yourself near one of these, you can call yourself absolutely fucked. Also worth mentioning real quick, their tails have a square cross section. Weird. Sick, nice for gripping slippery shit. They're also covered in armor, bony plates instead of scales. Sick. They also lost their caudal and pelvic fins. Didn't need them, but now they swim like shit. They're horrific swimmers. Matter of fact, the slowest fish in the ocean, which is not sick, but overall, boom, that's a seahorse, physically. Now let's get into reproductively. As you probably know, seahorse pregnancy is very avant-garde, done by the males. The only animals that have male pregnancy that we know of, that's pretty sick. Especially considering pregnancy has evolved independently over 150 times. Only one of those times it was the males. And actually, let me clarify, the whole family is pregnant fathers. Signathidae as a whole. And it can look different depending on the species. It can range from very simple egg attached to father setup, all the way to looks and acts like a human uterus, placenta and all. A gradient of pregnancy complexity, if you will. Let me explain how it works. A boy horse, not horse. <laughs> Seahorse. A boy seahorse and a girl seahorse fall in love. They get tangled up together in a lovely dance for a while, maybe even days. Males have a special brood pouch. Think of it kind of like a kangaroo pouch, it's either on their abdomen, trunk, or tail. The female has all the unfertilized eggs, as expected, and she deposits them into his pouch. As they're going in, the male is fertilizing them. The embryos make their way into individual compartments in the tissues on the pouch. The pouch acts a lot like a human uterus, complete with placenta-like structure that supplies the embryos with oxygen, nutrients, and even immune protection, which is very sick. This looks different depending on the species, like I said, with the complexity gradient in the whole synathidae family. In some pipe fish, the eggs are just stuck to the male's skin, no protection. In others, the eggs are covered by flaps of skin. In seahorses, the pouch is fully enclosed, skin everywhere, and the embryos are embedded in tissue that's packed with blood vessels, just like the mammalian placenta. Research within the last five years shows that male seahorses don't just provide oxygen and nutrients. They also deliver proteins to their developing embryos, which helps regulate growth and development. So seahorse dads are doing a lot more than just carrying the kids. They're actively feeding and protecting them, which is so sick and also cool and also very sick. But why the males? Why is this the only time we've ever seen this happen? Scientists are still figuring it out. The biggest idea is that it lets females start making more eggs while the male is carrying the current batch, which lets both parents maximize their reproductive output, which I guess, yeah, makes sense. Eggs take a lot of energy to make, but I don't know. I'm not buying it. I feel like we'd be seeing pregnant males all over the place if it was that simple. What the fuck do I know though? So to wrap it up, Pregnant males with full-on uteruses. This is the future liberals want, and now let's move on. I want to shout out some specifically sick seahorse species. The alliteration, yeah, because not all seahorses are the same. Take Bargabant's, I love that name. I hope it's pronounced like that. Bargabant's pygmy seahorse, found in 1969 by marine biologist George Bargabant. This species is arguably the best camouflaged animal on the planet. They live on certain species of Gorgonian coral. Their bodies are covered in tubercles. Tubercles. Tubercles, little bumps that perfectly mimic the color and texture of 
of their host, Coral. They're so well hidden that the first specimens were only discovered by accident. Scientists brought Coral back to the lab, and there just so happened to be tiny seahorses clinging to it. Very cute ones at that. Another pygmy seahorse. Pygmy seahorses are the best, to be honest. They're really cute. Satomi's pygmy seahorse. They're even smaller. They're less than a centimeter and a half long. There's also the pot belly seahorse, the biggest one. Big bellies, as you can see. And then there's the rest of the family. Pipefish. You kind of get what's going on with them. What about the sea dragons? I told you I was gonna get back to the sea dragons. Let me introduce you to some very sick ones. They are masters of camouflage, usually looking and moving like seaweed, such as the leafy sea dragon, arguably the icon of the sea dragon group. They're found in rocky reefs of southern and western Australia, and they just look like seaweed in the most beautiful way possible. They're covered in these leaf-like appendages, which are just lobes of skin that help it blend seamlessly into kelp and seagrass beds. They can get pretty big, like 30 to 46 centimeters long, and are so well camouflaged that once they're fully grown, they're pretty much predator free. They're also very low maintenance. They don't have to go anywhere. They can just hang out in the same spot for like days. They don't give a fuck. All right, next, the weedy sea dragon. Similar thing going on. Sea dragons are similar things. Definitely a lot less elaborate than the leafy sea dragon, but still worth mentioning because still very sick. Also found in Australia, can also get to 45 centimeters long. And the ruby sea dragon, the newest discovered and rarest member of the sea dragon family, only first described in 2015. They're found in deeper waters than their leafy and weedy relatives at at least 150 feet deep. They're also small, less than a foot long, and a very beautiful red hue, likely an adaptation to the dip red filtered light of deeper waters. Sea dragons are sick. And what's even more sick is that they are related to seahorses, which are also sick. So now it's time for you know the drill. The sick ass conservation work Planet Wild is doing to help the seahorses out. I've partnered with them before. I'm even a member myself. But if you're not familiar with them, they're a nature protection organization based in Berlin. It works globally on a variety of projects to protect endangered species, clean up waterways, or restore forests. Just last month, they announced their new mission to repopulate white seahorses in Sydney, Australia. If you didn't know, Sydney Harbor, despite being incredibly populated with boat traffic, is also a biodiversity hotspot and is home to white seahorse. The seagrass habitats the seahorses know and love have declined so the seahorses in the harbor have too. So, Planet Wild partnered with the Sydney Seahorse Project to build seahorse hotels, breed seahorse babies in the safety of their laps, and release them into the harbor to increase their population numbers. And this was all thanks to the 12,000 Planet Wild members who funded this project, which yes, could be you. They're essentially doing crowdfunding for nature. You can sign up for just six bucks a month, which is the same price as three French fries at Airwolf. And that money goes directly to funding their projects. You can also pledge more than $6 too if you can't, just whatever amount you want to donate monthly. Their team travels to the project of the month, documents the work the community is financing on site, and shows the impact in videos that you can watch on their YouTube channel. You get to support conservation efforts and see the direct impact of your contributions every single month. It's positive, it's hopeful, it's important, it'll feel really good. And if that's not enough of an incentive to sign up, I have another one. The first 150 people to sign up will enjoy the first month of a Planet Wild membership comped by me. You will already make an impact through that and see the results on the 15th of the following month. And if you don't feel like supporting Planet Wild anymore, you can cancel at any time, no questions asked. So go sign up at the link in the description or scan this QR code and use code Lindsay5 to get your first month paid for by me. Support real conservation and see the difference it's making one project at a time. And if you like this video, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss my next video. In the meantime, check out my Patreon for behind the scenes updates and our Discord server and live streams. And for now, stay curious. The world has a lot for us to learn. See ya.